Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. I'm Larry Swikart, co-author with Michael Allen of the great book, A Patriots History of the United States, now in its 40th printing with its fifth edition. And yes, I am working on an updated edition to be released later this year that will go up through 2023. From that point on, you're going to have to get my new book that'll be out in about 2025 called America in the 21st Century. All right. Meanwhile, please visit awildworldofhistory.com and take a look at all of our curricula for high schoolers. We have homeschool curricula and all sorts of other educational curricula in American and world history. The American History course has 22 lessons with me teaching everything in video, plus teacher's guide, student guide, tests, images that I use in the videos. World History has 15 lessons. These each cover a year in instruction. And the World History course has 15 videos, many of them longer, obviously, with me teaching all of them and the same thing. Teacher's guides, student guides, tests, and all the images we use that are downloadable. All right, let's get started. So in the last three meetings here, I haven't actually read from Patriots History of the United States. I read from, number one, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Number two, we spent a full 45 minutes or hour, something like that, on the Declaration of Independence. And then last time was a, a, an abridged version, but I just wanted to keep it to this one topic. And it was uh, Rush Limbaugh's father writing The Americans Who Risked Everything about the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So we are ready now to continue reading in the actual book, Patriots History of the United States. And as I always mention, I'm reading from the fifth anniversary, I'm sorry, the 15th anniversary edition, the 15th anniversary edition. And so if you have a different edition, the headers should be the same. So you should see North to Saratoga, but the page numbers will not be the same. So I am on page 88 North to Saratoga. Following his stunning surprise attack at Trenton and his subsequent victory at Princeton, Washington experienced defeats at Brandywine Creek and Germantown. In the second battle, the Americans nearly won and only the timely arrival of reinforcements gave the British a victory. Washington again had to retreat. Thus, this time, to winter quarters at Valley Forge near Philadelphia. What ensued was one of the darkest times for Washington and his army, while the British enjoyed warmth and food in one of America's richest cities. The Continentals suffered through a miserable winter, decimated by illness and starvation, eating soup made of, quote, burnt leaves and dirt. Washington deluged Congress with letters and appeals, soup, vinegar, and other articles followed by Congress. We see none, he wrote. Few men had more than a shirt and some none at all, and a number of men confined to hospitals for want of shoes. Gradually, the army obtained supplies and equipment. And in the Spartan environment, Washington fashioned a disciplined fighting force. Remember, I told you on a couple of occasions, the goal here was not to fight the British with militia, that the line from the Patriot, that Gates is a damn fool going toe to toe with the British in open field is madness. Remember Mel Gibson saying that, and that's not true at all. Uh, what was true was that going toe to toe with the British in open field with untrained regular troops was madness. But Washington was training his men to be as good as the Redcoats, it may be if not as experienced. Washington proved the glue that held the entire operation together. <clears throat> Consistent and unwavering, he maintained confidence in front of the men, all the while pouring a steady stream of requests for support to the Congress, which was not so much unreceptive as helpless. It wasn't they didn't want to help, they just didn't have any resources. Its only real source of income was the confiscation of Tory properties, which hardly provided the kind of funds demanded by armies in the field. 
as I mentioned before last time, Robert Morris nearly went broke trying to personally support the revolution. The printing of paper money, Continentals, had proven a disaster, and American commanders in the field had taken to issuing IOUs in return for food, animals, and other supplies. By the way, while it might not have been worth much in 1782 or 83, can you imagine what today it would be worth if you had an IOU signed by G. Washington? Yet in that frozen Pennsylvania hell, Washington hammered the Americans into a tough fighting force while the British grew lazy and comfortable, especially in New York and Philadelphia. Franklin quipped that Howe did not take Philadelphia so much as Philadelphia had taken Howe. The policy of occupying and garrisoning, quote, strategic hamlets proved no more successful in the 1770s than it did just 200 years later when an American army tried a similar strategy in Vietnam with much the same effect on the morale of the occupiers. You have to take the war to the enemy. You can't sit there and hope to starve him out or hope that he'll get tired. Howe's was not the only British army engaging the Americans. General John, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne <clears throat> launched an invasion of the Mohawk Valley where he was to be supported by a second British column coming from Oswego under Barry St. Ledger. A third British force under Howe was to join them by moving up the Hudson. The plan came apart rapidly in that Howe never moved north at all, and St. Ledger retreated in the face of Benedict Arnold and Nicholas Herkimer's forces. Remember I told you if the war had ended in 1777, 1778, that uh, Benedict Arnold would be considered one of the greatest American heroes of all time. And he's leading victory after victory in the North. Further, the Indian allies of the British abandoned them, leaving Burgoyne in a single column with extended supply lines deep in enemy territory. Now, I know this isn't Napoleon, and I know he doesn't have 611,000 men, but when Napoleon was going into Russia, it would take his forces 10 days to get past a certain city or town or whatever. So Burgoyne has that same problem. He, he's in a single long column stretched along a long road, very difficult to police in terms of keeping militia from sniping at you and easy to sever if you get enough cavalry attacking at one time. So it's not a good place to be. Having forgotten the fate of Varus's Roman legions in the Teutoburg force, forest centuries earlier, Burgoyne's wagons bore the general's fine china, best dress clothes, four-poster bed, and his mistress, all with her personal belongings. His column's entourage included 400, quote, women camp followers, some wives, many paid servants, some prostitutes. Whatever their intangible contributions to morale, they slowed Burgoyne's army to a crawl. So just in case you don't know, what happened in the um, Teutoburg Forest to Varus the legions, he sent in three Roman legions against the Germans. Now, they were being led, or guided, I should say, by a German convert named Hermann the German. I'm not kidding, that's his name, Hermann the German. And... Um, he convinced the Romans over a period of many years that he was a Roman and that he was loyal to Rome and he knew how to get them in to German territory at such a place that they could defeat the German tribes. All this time, uh, the, the Romans, by the way, called him Arminius. All this time, Arminius slash Herman was collaborating, communicating with the Germans. And he led Varus's three legions down a very narrow trail where only one group of legionnaires, four, five, six across at a time, could get through. The wagons were at the very end. The cavalry, for the most part, was scouting way ahead. And so at the proper time, the, the um, Romans found themselves with a, a swamp on one side 
and a steep hill on the other, and the Germans were embedded all through the hill under grass and so forth, camouflaged. And when the time came, the German army rode out and severed the cavalry scout units, severed the wagons at the rear, and completely overwhelmed the Romans who could not form up their legions in proper legion fighting formation. They could only form up a few at a time, and they were they were overwhelmed. So uh, this was at the time uh, one of the biggest losses of Rome in its entire history. I think it equaled that of Cana under Hannibal. So this is what's happening to Burgoyne. He's strung out along a long, narrow road, and his men are not going to be able to form up quickly or easily. After capturing Ticonderoga and scattering American forces at Hubberton, the British suffered a severe reverse when a scavenging party ran into American forces at Bennington, Vermont, and were defeated. When news of the victory reached New England towns, militia flooded into General Horatio Gates's command. He had 12,000 militia and 5,000 regulars facing Burgoyne's 6,000 regular troops with their extended supply lines. Burgoyne wasn't an idiot, and he sensed that he had to break the colonial armies before he was outnumbered or overtaxed, his overtaxed transport system collapsed, prompting him to launch two attacks at Freeman's Farm near Saratoga in September and October. The Patriots decisively won the second encounter, leaving Burgoyne to ponder escape or surrender, still placing his faith in reinforcements that, unbeknownst to him, would not arrive. Burgoyne partied in Saratoga, drinking and cavorting with his mistress. On October 17th, facing total defeat and with his army hungry, stranded, and surrounded, Burgoyne surrendered his entire force as the Yan band played Yankee Doodle. Now, by the way, a little culture note. This was a serious slur against the Americans. I'm not going to say exactly what it is, but it involves a, a sexual act of self-gratification, Yankee Doodle. And the Americans just were typical American. Oh, yeah, sounds like a great name. So they, they adopted the term and they adopted the song as their own. And it drove the British nuts. Why aren't these guys offended by this? We're trying to offend them. They weren't even offended by this. So the band plays Yankee Doodle and uh, Burgoyne surrenders. In this age of civility and warfare, the defeated British negotiated a convention rather than a capitulation under terms that specified the men should return to Europe under parole after Burgoyne hesitated to supply a listing of all troops. Congress revoked the terms and Burgoyne's army spent the remainder of the war in American captivity. Burgoyne himself received free passage back to England. So what had happened was they had an initial agreement whereby the men would sign a pledge saying, I won't take up arms against the Americans again and would be sent back to England. But Burgoyne botched that and delayed on that. So he said, to heck with you, we'll just take you all prisoners. But it's important to understand at this time that a prisoner of war who surrendered, it was quite common to be exchanged for other prisoners of war. And um, we see, for example, in Europe, about 20 years later, the Battle of Ulm, U-L-M, that Napoleon surrounded an army, an entire army of 100,000 Austrians. He didn't kill them all. It basically, raise, raise your right hand. All right, repeat after me. I state your name. I state your name. Promise never to take up arms against Napoleon. Promise never to take up arms against Napoleon. Again, again. So help me, God, whatever. So this is quite common. Um, it was the way you did war. And we see it last time that some of the founders' sons and family members were exchanged in this regard for um, various prisoners and officers. And you saw it in the movie, um, The Patriot, where Mel Gibson negotiates surrender of certain officers that turned out to be straw men, and that really, that really made Tarleton crazy. 
Next header on page 90, <clears throat> trust the French. And yes, I took this line from, from the movie, The Patriot. I really, I love that movie. Probably seen it a hundred times. Um, it is largely based on um, the Battle of Calpins that we'll cover in a little while in the South, in which, yes, the militia was stationed in the middle precisely to lure the British troops in. It tacted very much like, I just mentioned this, the Battle of Cana, where Hannibal uh, put his most loyal troops in the middle so he could order them to retreat so they wouldn't break and run. And when they retreated, they sucked the Romans in and then the armies came in around them on the side. Same thing happens at, at Calpins, which you see in the final battle there in the Patriot. And there's a great scene just before that battle where um, the actor Chris Cooper, who plays the colonel, and uh, the Frenchman, I cannot remember his name, and, and um, Mel Gibson, are riding together into battle. You know, and the Frenchman goes, trust the French, right? We, we have shown up. We did, we did come. Um, but the image that's portrayed there by the director is brilliant because it shows militia, regular army, and the French, the three elements that were required to win the revolution. The militia in the first part of the war, the regular army in the middle part of the war, and then all three together at the end of the war. So it's, it's just a great movie. Yes, they took some liberties, but the British Colonel Tavington is really a type of, of Colonel Tarleton, uh, Bannister Tarleton, who was known as a really wicked, merciless, ruthless guy. Anyway, back to trust the French. When spring arrived, the victory at Saratoga and the thousands of arms it brought to Washington's forces gave Americans new resolve. The ramifications of Saratoga stretched far beyond the battlefields of North America all the way to Europe, where the colonists had courted France as a potential ally since the outbreak of hostilities. France sensibly stayed out of the conflict until the patriots proved they had a chance of surviving. Sort of like political campaigns where some of the big donors sit on the sideline to you show you can win the primary, something like that. After Saratoga, however, Louis XVI agreed to discreetly support the American Revolution with munitions and money. A number of factors accounted for the willingness of France to risk involvement. First, the wounds of the Seven Years' War still ached, and France wanted revenge. This is going to be kind of a problem in French history. They always want revenge against somebody, and it's their sense of revenge that leads them into the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. They wanted revenge. Second, if America won independence without the help of American allies, French and Spanish territories in North America might be considered fair game for takeover by the new republic. In other words, well, we got this without you guys, so we'll just take what's here. And neither France nor Spain could defend those, those um, settlements. Finally, any policy that weakened English power abroad was viewed favorably at Versailles. Beginning in 1776, the Spanish trading company Hor Rodrigo Hortez de Cille, acting as France's agent, shipped over 30,000 muskets, 200 cannon, 25,000 uniforms, and a million pounds of powder to the Patriot Army, accounting for perhaps 90% of the American total powder at that time. Even before official help arrived from Louis' agent, In his court, numbers of individual Frenchmen had volunteered for service in the Continental Army, many seeking merely to advance mercenary careers abroad. Some came strictly for glory, including the extremely talented Louis Berthier, later to gain fame as Napoleon's chief of staff. Just a side note here. Berthier was so good. I mean, Napoleon was brilliant, and he could literally, in his mind, calculate the rate of march for an entire army with wagons and cannons, including weather. I mean, think of an air traffic controller who didn't need the screen to know where every plane was. That was Napoleon's mind. But 
to transmit his orders to his marshals, Napoleon needed somebody who could read his mind and write down that stuff in the proper way. And that was Berchet. And it's very interesting that Berchet died, fell off a roof and died before the Battle of Waterloo when one of Napoleon's most crucial orders to Marshal Grouchy was misunderstood and Grouchy went away from the Battle of Waterloo rather than to the Battle of Waterloo. <clears throat> More than a few sincerely wish to see America succeed for re idealistic reasons, including the Marquis de Lafayette, the young nobleman who in 1777 presented himself to Washington, who accorded him a nomination for major general. But the colonies needed far more than laundered money and a handful of, of, of adventurers. They needed the French Navy to assist in transporting the Continental Army, giving it the mobility that the British enjoyed, and they could benefit from the addition of French troops as well. To that end, the Continental Congress dispatched Silas Dean in early 1776 as its agent to Paris, and Dean didn't go over very well, and so they dispatched Arthur Lee and Benjamin Franklin to join him. Franklin emerged as the premier representative in France, not just because Congress recalled Dean in 1777 because he was ineffective, but because the droll Franklin was received as a celebrity by the Parisians. So here's what happened. Franklin, who's one of the best read men in all of America, remember he was a publisher, so he read everything. He was very good with the English language, uh, very well educated, if not in, in actual university settings in life. And he perceived immediately that the French wanted a celebrity. They, they wanted, in a later sense, they wanted a Davy Crockett or a Daniel Boone. Uh, those guys didn't exist yet, or at least not as the heroes they would be. So Franklin goes over and he gives them exactly what they want. Varying his dress from Quaker simplicity to frontier buckskins, the clever Pennsylvanian effortlessly quoted Voltaire or Newton, yet he appealed to the common footmen and chambermaids. So everybody says, oh man, this chamberlain is great. You got to have, you got to have Ben to your party. Folks, you got to get, he becomes an A-lister as we would say today. Most importantly to the struggle to enlist French aid, however, Franklin adroitly utilized British conciliation proposals to convince France that America might attain independence without her. In February 1778, France signed commercial and political treaties with the Continental Congress. Um, of course, this is after Saratoga. Why is that important? Because Americans showed at Saratoga we could fight and win without the French. In February 1778, France signed commercial and political treaties with the Continental Congress, agreeing that neither side would make a separate peace without the other. Now, this business of a separate peace becomes a long-standing thing in American history. We get stung badly in World War I because the Russians, after a revolution, make a separate peace with Germany, and the Germans transfer something like a million men to the Western Front and prolong the war. So in World War II, we're going to see that both Churchill and, St and uh, Roosevelt are adamant in their meetings with Stalin at, at um, Yalta that there's no separate peace, that he will not make a separate peace. And they only continue to supply him with weapons on that ground. That if he ever backs out and makes a separate peace, all the aid stops. Obviously, they, they wouldn't need it, but they might, right? Anyway, Spain joined the war in April 1779 as an ally of France for the purpose of regaining Gibraltar from the British, Majorca, Jamaica, and Florida. By 1780, France and Spain had put more than 120 warships into action in the American theater and combined with heroic, harassing escapades of John Paul Jones, 
menaced British shipping lanes, besieged Gibraltar, and threatened Jamaica and captured Mobile and Pensacola. French ships commanded by Admiral Jean-Baptiste de Stang even mounted an unsuccessful attack on Newport, Rhode Island before retreating to the West Indies. British abuses at sea already had alienated Holland, which in 1780 joined Denmark, Sweden, Portugal, and Russia in the League of Armed Neutrality, whose members agreed their ships would fire on approaching British vessels at sea rather than submit to boarding. In an amazing display of diplomatic ineptitude, the British managed to unite all the major navies of the world against its quest to blockade a group of colonies that lacked a navy of their own. Not only did that place all of England's supply and transport strategies in America at risk, but it internationalized the war in such a way as to make England seem a bully and a villain. Perhaps most important of all, aid and support arrived at the very time that Washington's army had dwindled to extremely low levels. Now, let me return to the very opening phases of the war, because this is very important. One of Washington's first acts was to send emissaries to all the Indian tribes, and he secured neutrality from every one. That is key. If we'd had to fight the Indians in addition to the British, not sure we would have made it. But now, not only are the Indians neutral, but France and Spain are our allies, and Denmark, Holland, and other countries are in an armed neutrality, meaning they are virtually enemies of England if England tries to do anything to any of their ships. Now, that's some diplomacy there, especially coming from a very young nation that didn't really have much to bargain with or give away. Really incredible. Southern invasion, northern betrayal. We start on 91, and I think this will be the last section for today, checking the time. <clears throat> Despite the failures at Trenton, Princeton, and Saratoga, the British still fielded five substantial armies in North America. Now, this is one of the problems. You're going to see that Britain, even though they have a lot more manpower, a lot more firepower, they can never unite it into one big thrust. And um, that doesn't ensure victory. Remember, Napoleon only had one big thrust going into Russia, but he lost. Hitler had three, and he lost. So sometimes you're not going to win no matter what you do. But by having armies all over the colonies, the British diffused and dissipated their military forces, and often we're trying to decide who should we support here? Should we send the Navy there? And as a result, they didn't have one big thrust. Um, an opposite situation could be found, for example, when the British invaded Zululand in 1879, and that time, with the exception of one setback at San Luana, they kept one major column together the whole time so they didn't dissipate their forces, their firepower, and they basically forced the Zulus to come after them, to come out in the open. So just kind of a historical note there. British generals also concluded, however, that their focus on the northern colonies had been misplaced and that their true base of loyalist support lay in the south. These would be the Tories. Georgia and the Carolinas contained significant numbers of Tories, allowing the British forces to operate in somewhat friendly territory. In 1778, the Southern Offensive began when the British landed near Savannah. In the meantime, Washington suffered a blow of personal nature. Benedict Arnold, one of his most capable subordinates and an officer who'd been responsible for the victories at Ticonderoga, Quebec, and in part Saratoga, chafed under the apparent lack of recognition of his efforts. In 1778 and 79, he commanded the garrison in Philadelphia, where he married Peggy Shippen, a wealthy Tory who encouraged him his spending and speculation. In 1779, a committee charged him with misuse of official funds. Now, this really hurt Arnold badly and ordered Washington to discipline Arnold. Instead, Washington, still loyal to his officer, praised Arnold's military record. 
Although he received no former formal reprimand, Arnold had amassed huge personal debts to the point of bankruptcy. Arnold played on Washington's trust to obtain the command of the strategic fort West Point on the Hudson River, whereupon he intrigued to turn West Point over to the British General Henry Clinton. Arnold used a courier, British Major John Andre, and nearly succeeded in surrendering West Point. Andre, wearing civilian clothes that made him, in the technical terms, a spy, stumbled into the hands of patriots who seized incriminating documents that he had hidden in his boot. Arnold managed to escape to England, but Andre was tried and executed for his treason and later interred as a British national hero at Westminster Abbey. <clears throat> Britain appointed Arnold to a brigadier general and gave him command of small forces in Virginia. He retired to England in 1781, where he ended his life bankrupt and unhappy. His name in America equated with treason. As colonial historian O.H. Chitwood observed, if Arnold, quote, could have remained true to his first love for a year longer, his name would probably be now, now would have a place next to that of Washington in the list of revolutionary heroes, unquote. <clears throat> Events in the South soon required Washington's full attention. The British invasion force at Savannah turned northward in 1779, and the following year, two British columns advanced into the Carolinas, embattled constantly by guerrilla fighters, Thomas Sumter, Andrew Pickens, and the famed Swamp Fox, Francis Marion, on whom the um, uh, Benjamin character uh, in The Patriot is based on the Swamp Fox. Lord Cornwallis managed to forge ahead, engaging and crushing a Patriot army at Camden, but this only brought the capable Nathaniel Green to command over the inept Horatio Gates. So, so Cornwallis did us a favor by getting rid of Gates. Upon receiving Washington's order to assume command of the Southern Continental Army, Green told his wife, what I have been dreading has come to pass. Green embraced Washington's view that avoiding defeat was as important as winning battles, becoming a master of what Russell Wigley, a military historian, calls quote, partisan war, conducting a retreat designed to lure Cornwallis deep into the Carolina interior. Cornwallis soon learned that his enemy in the South was different than the many faced in the North. The majority were Scotch-Irish, and they held particular bitterness for England. It is estimated that as much as one half the American forces who opposed the British in the field were of Scots-Irish descent. Cornwallis found his movements checked in October 1780 at Kings Mountain when British Major Patrick Ferguson and more than 1,100 loyalists were killed or captured by fewer than 1,000 Patriot militia. It constituted one of the high points of the American militia and shattered the Tory movement in the South. So that's where we're going to stop today. Next time we'll get Calpin's major victory and Yorktown. Hope you're enjoying this, and I hope that you're checking out all the free stuff on the wild world of history. Folks, look under blogs. Just poke around. You're going to find 40 or 50 small one to two page articles about different events in history, like the winged hussars, or prohibition, or the origins of the income tax, or Andrew Jackson, or anything like that. There's tons of free stuff on there. Um, Coming soon, my autobiography. We're going to have excerpts available here in the next 10 days for uh, VIP holders. And then if you like it, you'll, the VIP holders will be able to get the free autobiography and others can go get it on Amazon cheap. We're going to have it available very inexpensively. Hey, what have I done to rate an autobiography? Well, let's see. I was born on a farm. Um, I opened as a rock drummer for Steppenwolf, the James Gang, Savoy Brown. I became a history professor and wrote a book before I graduated with my master's degree, even though I'd never written anything in my life up to that time. I got a PhD, the first in my family to get a PhD from University of California, Santa Barbara. I um, hosted and drove 
for a Ronald Reagan event in 1984, where I drove Beverly Sills and Merle Haggard and the Outlaws up to the event and was at an event with Bo Derrick, Fred McMurray, Ron Ely, Tarzan, Mike Connors, Mannix, a whole bunch of other people. Um, I got a job in the University of Wisconsin system where I became an NCAA basketball coach. I um, was floating down a barge in the Danube River where I debated Milton Friedman in front of the buffet. Uh, I ended up teaching for 30 years history at the University of Dayton. I published several New York Times or other bestsellers, only one New York Times bestseller, but a Wall Street Journal bestseller. I made uh, two movies. I taught aerobics with my wife for several years, high impact aerobics like Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. So I've advised presidents. I was invited to the White House to spend an hour in the Oval Office with President Bush. Uh, I've worked with Steve Bannon to help get President Trump elected. A um, lot of stuff. So you might find it an interesting autobiography and that should be available uh, after we release the excerpts. And remember, oh yeah, buy me a coffee. We're trying to turn Patriots History of the United States into a video series, and I need your help. Watch the trailer, Wild World of History, and buy Larry a coffee if you like the trailer, and we will get this made. And I will see you guys back here on Wednesday.